there we are. Okay, so uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna divide this presentation in three parts. The first one is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna tell you what are the basic scanning views and how can you do this? So I'm gonna try and explain how to position the transducer uh, within the animal and uh, how to actually get a good image and how does that image need to be. Then the second part is gonna be all the measurements that you can do with those scanning views. So we're gonna talk about the B mode uh, measurements, the M mode measurements, uh, and then the Doppler color, uh, pulsated wave and continuous wave. And then the last part is gonna be a few clinical cases. It's, I try to condense everything. We only have like an hour, an hour and a half. So uh, I condense everything and uh, I'm only gonna talk about the basic stuff. So obviously there can be other views that, um, that we can do and other measurements that we can do. But uh, today we're only gonna talk about the basic ones. So first of all, we need to uh, uh, position our patient. Uh, this is my dog, Google. And um, on the left side, you can see we can do it standing or on the right side, you can, uh, you can see we can do it laying down. So differences, well, uh, standing, we are gonna be positioned right here on the left side of the animal. Our um, ultrasound machines can be right here. And what we're gonna do, we're not gonna change uh, positions, either us or the animal. So for the right side, we're gonna put our hand or our arm underneath the chest and we're gonna do it from this side. So from the, the left side, we're gonna do it. And then one, once we, we finish, we're gonna do the left side, just on the, just position uh, the, trans, the transducer on the left side of the, of the dog. Uh, laying down, let me see if I can minimize this because maybe you can't see it. Hold on. Let's see, okay, there we are. Um, so on the, um, on, the, uh, on the laying down position, what we need is either uh, we need a, a table that has a hole in it so we can put our hand underneath, or we need a, a table that uh, is gonna elevate the dog or the cat in order for us to put our hand underneath. So this is an article, uh, it was published a long time ago. Um, it's gonna, in this article, they talk about the differences between doing uh, an ultrasound uh, or an echocardiogram on a standing position or on a, um, on a laying down position. They only use four healthy dogs, which I think in, in this case, there weren't too many. But uh, what they found is that um, uh, the standing position didn't change much with uh, the quality of the images and the quality of the, of the measurements. In my personal experience, I do it laying down. And this is why. Well, first of all, it's faster. And this is only from my personal experience. Uh, for me, it's faster because uh, the acoustic window that you have is gonna be larger. Obviously, the air is gonna go up. And uh, so you're gonna have more space, more space to, to work with. And then also the patient's gonna have less movement. So what happens with me when I try to do it standing is that um, the dog, especially cats, is, <laughs> almost impossible, but uh, with, uh, with dogs, they start moving a little forward, a little backward, so they're not still, so it takes me longer uh, to do them. Also, in my case, scanning views are more accurate when I do them laying down, especially the epic, uh, sorry, the um, right personal um, long axis. And then uh, also, after a few minutes, the patient calms down, and the restraining becomes much less necessary. The cons of doing it on a laying down position is first of all, you have to convince the owner and the veterinarian. This is something that for me is uh, one of those uh, challenges because first of all, the owner uh, most of the time is like, oh no, 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 we're not gonna be able to do it. He's not gonna stay still. And then even the most um, terrifying chihuahua, you are able to do it. And then second one is veterinarian. Even the veterinarian is gonna say, a lot of times, no, 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 we're not gonna be able to do that with this dog. So you have to convince them, you have to show them that yes, we can do it. The only time I don't do um, on a laying down position is when they're in dyspnea, so when they're not breathing okay, uh, when they're very nervous. So um, once, uh, once you're, uh, you put them laying down, they're, you're struggling a lot, they're getting very, very stressed out, then you just quit and you're doing a standing position. And then also for some giant breeds, especially Great Danes. Great Danes, I don't, I don't even try. They, I you know, treat them as, uh, as horses. 
So, um, again, this is my personal experience. Um, we don't care, no one cares how you do them, how you do the echocardiogram exam, as long as you get good images and good measurements. So how are you gonna start? First of all, you're gonna uh, start with a, between the third and the fourth intercostal space. My little tip here is put your hand, trying to find the point of maximal intensity, and that is where you're gonna put the probe. And from there, you're gonna start switching and trying to find your, uh, your position. With the feelings heart, uh, remember it's more aligned with the sternum. So you, you might have to move the probe closer to the sternum. And then just remember, if you're starting um, and you, you've done uh, abdominal ultrasound and you're starting to do echo, just remember the movements and rotations are done slowly and slightly. It's not like um, with the abdominal ultrasound that you can just move and the organ is just gonna stay there. <laughs> the heart moves a lot, obviously it's pumping. So um, every little rotation, every little movement is gonna be uh, done slowly and slightly or you could, use, uh, you could lose the entire view. So let's start with the scanning views. The first scanning view that we're going to see, um, that we're going to talk about, is the right parasternal long axis four chamber view. So right is on the right side, parasternal, we're going to do it in between the intercostal space. Long axis, it means you're going to see the long view of the, vent uh, of the ventricle. Four chamber view. So we're going to have four chambers. The right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. So how are we gonna position the transducer? Well, first of all, the marker is gonna be at 12 o'clock. So the spine of the animal is here, the head of the animal is here. So the marker is gonna be at 12 o'clock and you have to make uh, an angle of 45 degrees between the thorax of the animal and the transducer. Once you're there, you might have to lift and drop a little bit, maybe rotate a little bit in order to get a uh, maximized uh, left ventricle because this is what you wanna get. So this is an optimized um, image. What you need is the long axis of the ventricle to be perpendicular to the beam. In this case, we have less of an angle. So we don't have a 90 degree angle, we have a little bit less. So when this happens, you're positioned like this. When this happens, you just you have to lift the tail towards the spine a little bit and the apex, so you can see here, the apex will drop while you're doing that. Okay, so we're not gonna talk about the measurements right now, but once you have an image and you have a view, you can, you can still do, and um, you can do, let's say, like, we can see a lot in that image without doing any measurements. So what are we gonna, we're gonna see? Well, first of all, the right ventricle anterior wall, even though we're not measuring, just by looking at it, the right ventricle anterior wall has to be less than 50% of the left ventricle posterior wall. Okay, so again, not, without measuring, um, you'll get used to seeing a lot of images, and, um, but you'll see how to um, consider it if, it's, uh, if it's already thickened or not. Then the uh, tricuspid valve, you're gonna see that it's a, a few millimeters more apical than the mitral valve. Then you're gonna see the interventricular septum. You're gonna look at it and see if it's displaced. And if it is, during what part of the cycle is, because that is gonna uh, give you a lot of information about the right ventricle. The interatrium septum, you're gonna see if it's normal, if it's straight, if it's towards the right atrium or towards the left atrium, that is gonna tell you also about enlargement of the atriums. Then um, you're gonna see the mitral valve. Is it thickened, like in this case? Or is it normal? Is it prolapsed? And then uh, this is something that is going to be very subjective. So you're going to see the left ventricle and the left atrium, are they enlarged? Again, this is something that is going to be subjective, but you can already have an idea once you uh, get this view. So in this case, we have here, we have a flattened interventricular septum. This is in telediastole. And you can see here it's not straight, it's a little bit towards the left ventricle. Here, for example, we have, I put you the measurements here, but just so you get an idea, the right ventricular uh, anterior wall is more or less the same as the um, uh, left ventricle posterior wall. So you can see the, the measurements here is almost four millimeters and um, this one and almost five. So they're more or less the same, it should be 
uh, less than two and a half. Okay, so you can already have an idea of that. Here we have a normal mitral valve, it's thin. And we have here, we have a thickened mitral valve. So you can see it right there. This is the image of a cat. Um, this is in Sicily, but uh, I wanted you to, to see a little bit the differences. Um, even though it's gonna be harder for you to get a good um, image, a good uh, personal long axis for view, especially a good um, perpendicular um, angle, you can still do it. You can see it here. It's, uh, I, I, it's pretty good. Um, it's not the useful thing, but you can still do it. So really try hard to do it. Okay, now we're gonna go to the right parasternal long axis, but in this case, five chamber view. That is the left ventricular outflow view. So what it means is that I, we're gonna see the outflow tract, which is the aorta here. So we're gonna have the left ventricle here, mitral valve, left atrium, aorta, interventricular septum, right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium. How are we gonna do this? So starting from the uh, long axis four chamber, which was, the marker was at 12 o'clock, we're gonna rotate a little bit counterclockwise in order to put it at 11 o'clock, and you don't have to move anything. So don't tilt, move, or drop the transducer, it's just gonna pop out. So once you rotate a little bit, you're gonna see this. So what can we see in this, uh, in this view? What, uh, we're gonna see them, uh, the aortic valve. We're gonna see if it's normal, is it thickened? And uh, then we're gonna see if there are any abnormal complications. Usually, especially in cats, we're gonna find them right here. Those are obviously the ventricular septal defects. Okay, now we're gonna go to the short axis, left ventricle view. So, in this case, this is the left ventricle, we call it the mushroom uh, view, right? Because it looks like a mushroom. So this is the left ventricle, interventricular septum, right ventricle. So with the transducer, with the transducer we started at 12 o'clock, then we rotated a little bit to 11 o'clock. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate a little bit more in order to be at nine o'clock. So perpendicular to uh, where we started, uh, again, counterclockwise. And once we're there, we're gonna optimize the view by fanning the tail. So we're gonna go towards the, the spine or the sternum in order to go apical or uh, more to the heart base. That way you're gonna optimize. If you wanna see the apex, you're gonna um, tilt the, the tail towards the spine. If you wanna uh, see more of the, of the mitral valve, so more towards the heart base of the, of the heart. Sorry, the heart base. Um, then you're gonna uh, put the tail, bring it towards the sternum. Okay, so what can we see without doing any measurements? What can we see? So we're gonna see, uh, is the chamber symmetrical? Are the papillary muscles, which are right here, are they similar to each other? Is the interventricular septum flattened? We can also see it here. Well, sometimes you can see it right there. And, um, it's a contraction. Obviously, uh, I didn't put a video to avoid um, connection problems, but uh, you can see if the contraction is uniform. And then also here, you can see the right ventricle anterior wall, which is this one. You can compare it to the left ventricle posterior wall, which is this one. In a cat, um, in, this, in this case, we have a very good image. A lot of times, especially with um, HCM, so with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're gonna have a very small left ventricle. So you might not get uh, such a good image, but you can still get it. The angle is probably gonna be more towards the left side. So usually on the dog, we have it more towards here. In the cat, we have it more towards the left side. Okay, then we move a little bit towards the heart base and we're gonna see the mitral valve. With the mitral valve, which is this, and this is, uh, we call the, um, the fish mouth, right? Because it looks like a fish opening and closing its mouth. And then we're gonna see the valve movement. We're gonna see if they're symmetric valves. And obviously we're gonna see if they're thickened. Okay, then we move towards the heart base and we're gonna get the left atrium, left atrium aorta view. So to get a good image, we need to see the aortic valve right there. 
and we need to see the left article because that way we know that we're maximizing the size of the um, of the left atrium. So we're still going to be at nine o'clock. The marker is going to be uh, at nine o'clock. But as before, as I was telling you before, we're going to tilt the tail away from the table or towards the sternum. So we're going to tilt it, and that way we're going to um, we're going to see it. And once we're there, we're going to optimizing by rotating a little until we see the left article popping up. This is the same thing in cat. Uh, a lot of times you don't get um, such a good image, but again, try and try because cats, I know it's uh, that fear of uh, doing a cat. You can still get good images. So just uh, do a lot of them and uh, you'll, you'll just get the hand to do it. Okay, then we're gonna be always with a heart base, always in short axis, but now we're gonna concentrate on the right ventricle outflow tract and pulmonary artery view. So always at nine o'clock the marker, what we're gonna do is we're gonna tilt the tail away from the table. So you're still gonna uh, tilt it a little bit towards the sternum, but in this case, you may need to move the transducer one space caudally. So you move the transducer caudally one space, and then once you're there, you might have to, um, um, sorry, move it. So not tilt it, just move it away from the spine. So always towards the sternum. So you tilt the tail, you move uh, one uh, intercostal uh, space, and then you move the transducer a little bit. Moving the transducer is gonna allow you to have a, an angle um, that is gonna be more aligned with the, with the beam. That way, obviously you're gonna see, you can see a good image of the valve, but that way, once we do the measurements with the pulsated wave or the continuous wave, we're gonna be more aligned. As you can see here, this is the pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery, right main pulmonary artery, and this is gonna be the left one. Obviously, right uh, ventr uh, ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium. Okay, so what can we see here? We're gonna see, obviously, the pulmonary valve. Is it symmetric? Is it, um, does it have normal valves, uh, or sorry, normal uh, valve leaflets, and uh, is it, does it have a normal movement? Um, do we have any post-stenotic dilation, you're going to see it right there, if there is. Um, and then we're going to see, are there any thrombos, especially here and here, are, are going to be any thrombos, or durifilaria, which is heartworm, are we going to see them? Usually we see them right here. And then you might find some, uh, some tumors, so those are masses, like for example, chemotectoma, you can find them right here or here. This is durifilaria, so this is heartworm, this is how you're going to see it. I always recommend for you, even though uh, this was a, a positive uh, case, so I was already um, kind of having an eye to try and find them. But I have to say, I have found them in, uh, in dogs that uh, they didn't do any tests. So always make sure that you see the, um, that you take a look at the, uh, at the bifurcation, because you might find some uh, not so grateful um, surprises. So with the heartworm, you're going to see two hyperechoic lines parallel to each other. So like the railway uh, view. Okay, now the subcoastal. The subcoastal view, it's something that not a lot of, um, of examiners do. When you're doing in the standing position, for me, it's very, very difficult to do it. I try to do it in almost uh, all the dogs and cats. I don't do it, um, but on almost all the dogs, I try to do it and uh, I'll, I'll explain why, but um, how you do it. So you're gonna put the transducer, obviously it's not gonna be personal, so you're gonna go underneath the, um, the thorax. So this is hyphoid, you're gonna go underneath. The marker is gonna be towards the spine, so the spine of the dog is here, the head of the dog is here, and you're gonna uh, place the marker towards the spine, and you're gonna place the transducer as parallel uh, to the spine as possible. So this is the view, this is the aorta, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, right ventricle. And this is why, because once we, um, we have it here, we're gonna be much more aligned to get a uh, pulsated wave um, and the continuous wave measurements. So in order to get uh, obviously the pulsated uh, or the aortic flow, we're gonna be more aligned. And also when we have an insufficiency, we're also gonna be more aligned. So I try to do it uh, in every dog. 
Okay, then we move to the left side. So we're gonna be in the left, parasternal, apical, four chamber view. Okay, four chamber, one, two, three, four. Mitral valve, tricuspid valve. So how are we gonna do it? We're gonna place a transducer um, with a 30 degree. So the thorax is here. The transducer has to have a 30 degree. And the marker is always gonna to be towards the spine. So here's the spine of the dog. You're gonna place a marker towards the spine. So most of the times you're gonna get this image. So with this image, it's okay. But the thing is uh, with a lot of measurements is not, um, is not the optimal um, view. So what we're gonna do is we need to have the, um, the long axis of the left ventricle has to be parallel to the, uh, to the beam. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna move the transducer towards the sternum. So you have this view, you move the transducer towards the sternum, again, not tilting, just moving it. And that is gonna make that the apex goes to the right side and you're gonna get this view. So what are we gonna see here? Well, we're gonna see the valve movement, obviously. We're gonna see the mitral valve appearing. So is it thickened, is it prolapsed, as in, here you can see that it's a liver prolapsed on um, the anterior leaflet. Is it dysplastic? Then we're gonna see the tricuspid valve. Is it dysplastic also? So is it, uh, how is its position um, compared to the mitral valve? It has to be a few millimeters, but when you have it here, you know, it might be a um, tricuspid of dysplasia. And then always subjective, we're gonna check the left of the chamber. So we're gonna check the left ventricle, the left, left atrium, the right ventricle, and the right atrium. Then we're gonna to move to the five chamber view. So how are we gonna move? Again, not, no, not moving anything first. The marker was here towards the spine. We're gonna rotate the transducer counterclockwise until the aorta appears. So you just, again, very, very slight moves. You rotate it a little bit and then it pops out the aorta. Once you have it, you might have it, especially with cats, you might have it right here. So you're not gonna get a good angle. This is why I usually do the subcoastal. So in order to get a better angle, what you have to do is you have to tilt the tail away from the table. So towards the sternum, you're just gonna tilt it to align the aorta to the beam. Again, aorta, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, right ventricle. What we're gonna do here, well, more or less the same as, uh, as we did uh, with the subcostal. So we're gonna see the uh, valve movement and the anatomy. So do we see any changes? Okay, and then last but not least, uh, we're gonna do the left parasternal apical optimize for the tricuspid valve. So this is something that not a lot of people are used to do. I strongly recommend it because um, you're gonna get a good image of the tricuspid valve. And also, I'll explain later, also you can, um, you're gonna get a, a lot of images in order to, um, uh, let's say, um, do measurements for the, for the right ventricle. So from the um, apical four chamber view, you move the tail towards the spine. So you tilt it a little bit towards the spine. You move one intercostal space cranially and then you rotate the transducer counterclockwise. It seems like a lot of stuff, but once you get the hand, it's not so much. So tilt the tail, move one intercostal space, and then rotate a little bit until you get a good image of the tricuspid valve. Like here, for example, you have a good image. The angle, obviously, you're tilting the, the tail towards the spine, so obviously the angle is not gonna be as parallel as the, with the apical four chamber view, but, we need to see this part, so this doesn't matter. But you can see here, this was um, a prolapse um, tricuspid valve, so it's very good. You get a good image of, uh, of this area. Also, with the mantra, I'm sorry, with the tricuspid regurgitations, you're gonna be more aligned also to get, um, to get a, good, uh, a good wave. Okay, now we're gonna start with the measurements. So, right parasternal long axis view, Obviously, the four chamber long axis view. So, with the B mode, we're going to measure the mitral annulus, the left atrium width, the HX fraction with the Simpson method, and the ventricular wall thickness. With the M mode, I'm going to explain it, so don't worry. With the M mode, 
we're going to do the E point septal separation. With a collar Doppler, we're going to see mitral regurgitation or any abnormal communications like uh, ventral, uh, ventricular septal defects or uh, atrial septal defects. And then with a continuous wave, if there are any abnormal communications, we can, uh, we can measure them. So the mitral analysts. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to draw a line from hinge point to hinge point of the mitral valve. That is going to be a measurement. And you can see here, um, there's an article that uh, explains very good. It's, uh, it's been in the, published in the last few years. And um, uh, it explains that uh, they did, uh, they came out with uh, some normal reference, uh, reference range. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure the mitral annulus in diastole, which is an N diastole, in systole, which is going to be an N systole. You can see here uh, for the diastole, it's going to be the first frame after the mitral valve closure. And then for the systole, it's going to be the frame prior, the last frame prior to the mitral valve opening. So both of them are going to be the mitral valve closed. The first one is uh, an N diastole, is going to be the first frame right after the mitral valve closed. And is closed, and um, the systole is going to be right before the mitral valve is open. Then, um, what did the, uh, what they discover with this uh, article is the conclusions are that when we have a more dense myxematous uh, mitral valve disease, the mitral annulus was increased. So this is a good way to stage and see if we can uh, find out if we have a more advanced uh, disease. Uh, the, um, with the B mode also, we're going to do the ejection fraction. I'm not going to explain the Simpson mode here. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, the Simpson method here. I'm going to explain it with the apical view, but just so you know, we have to also do it uh, with this view. Okay, then um, the left atrium width. So what um, we're going to measure here, you can also hear, uh, you can also read this article. It's also been published in the, in the last few years. And um, it's, um, it's a ratio that we can do complementing the, the usual one that we do with the left atrium aorta of the um, short axis uh, heart base view. And uh, again, it's to complement both uh, the other ones. So you get both of them. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw a line. You're going to obviously be in this, um, in this view. You're going to draw a line that is going to bisect the atrium. It's going to be in end diastole. So again, one or two frames right before the opening of the um, of the mitral valve, sorry, and systole, and because that's gonna where we're gonna have the maximum um, size of the left atrium. So, and systole, we see when the mitral valve is opening, then we go back a little bit, one or two frames right before, and we draw a line that is gonna go from mid atrial septum to the pericardial echo. We're just gonna draw a line. You're gonna measure it it's gonna be roughly parallel to the mitral annulus, okay? So you can imaginary, see the mitral annulus, draw a line. And with this measurement, you're gonna um, do a ratio with the aorta. I'm gonna explain uh, what measurement of the aorta afterwards, but just so you know, with this measurement, it's gonna be the normal value is gonna be between 1.8 and 2.4. This, um, again, is to complement because with the, uh, with a regular um, short axis heart base view, a lot of times you get some error. So subjectively you see it and you see that we have a, an enlarged uh, atrium and then you see it and yeah, it's not so large as you thought. Well, you, you know, when you do this one too, you can, you're gonna complement and you're gonna see, well, and this one is much larger. So maybe the other one, it was underestimated. Also, obviously, as we were talking before, where you're gonna measure the right ventricular um, anterior wall, and you're gonna compare it to the left ventricle posterior wall. As uh, I said before, it has to be less than 50%. Okay, so the E point um, septal separation, what we're gonna do is with the beam, with the MO beam or MO line, we're gonna go at the level, at the tip of the cranial mitral leaflet, so right there. And then with the M mode, you're gonna measure the distance between the leaflet and the interventricular septum. The EPSS has to be less than 6.5 millimeters. This article explains very good how, uh, how you should do it. And uh, it was done in, in Doran Pinterest, which is um, uh, obviously a, a breed that we really wanna make sure that, that they don't have DCM, so. 
Obviously, color Doppler, we're going to see much of a rotation. We can have a semi-quantitative uh, evaluation. This is obviously subjective. Then uh, we can have color Doppler and co uh, continuous wave of any abnormal communications that we might have here. Okay, the long axis five chamber view, so the left ventricular outflow view. With the B mode, we're gonna measure the aortic diameter. Then we're gonna measure the aortic di diameter for that ratio that I was telling you before. We're also gonna measure the uh, interventricular septum and left ventricle posterior wall thickness, for, especially for cats. Color Doppler, uh, we're gonna see if there's any aortic insufficiency, if there are any abnormal communications. If there's an outflow obstruction, like for example, with a systolic anterior movement with a HCM in cats, or if it's a turbulent flow. We're also gonna measure with a continuous wave of any abnormal communications that we find. So the aortic diameter, as with the wall, hinge point to hinge point of the, of the aortic ball. Okay, so for the ratio I was telling you before with the left atrium width, what we're gonna do is uh, you're gonna um, you're going to measure the, the distance between the leaflets at uh, the point where the um, aortic valve is open, so it has uh, the maximum um, diameter. And this is going to be, as you can see here, an early systole, okay? And you're going to measure, you, you're not going to include the valsava sinus. In this case, with the interior leaflet, you might have to, just because you can't see it here, but especially in this, you have to make sure that you're with the uh, aortic leaflet and not including the Volseva uh, sinus. This is what happens also with um, the short axis uh, heart-based view is that a, a lot of times we, can, we consider those so we're overestimating the aorta so the ratio gets, uh, gets lower. Okay, so uh, we're gonna measure also the interventricular septum and left ventricle posterior wall thickness, especially in cats. We consider hypertrophy when it's over six millimeters, but be careful because some breeds are not uh, considered um, the, um, let's say like the limit is not considered six millimeters. It can be considered five millimeters, like for example, with Sphinx cats. So be careful with some breeds. This is another article that you can read uh, and it, it's very, very good uh, explaining how to do the measurements. And, uh, but um, I'm gonna try and go over it. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna uh, make, four different measurements all along the wall. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. In order to consider um, a left ventricle hyper, uh, hypertrophy, you have to have the, um, the hypertrophic area has to be more than 50% of the wall. So yes, you can have an, an area, sorry, <coughs> hypertrophic area, but in order to consider a left ventricular hypertrophy, you have to have more than 50%, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you're also gonna see if that a hypertrophy is gonna be symmetric or is it gonna be asymmetric. And then once you um, have a left ventricular hypertrophy, you're gonna have to exclude hypertension dehydration and hyperthyroidism. So obviously some of them you can um, exclude right away with dehydration, you can you have the N1 in front of you so you can just see it. Uh, but with hypertension and hyperthyroidism, you have to ask the veterinarian to do, some other, to, to do some other stuff. So a lot of times you can't give a diagnosis right away, you have to put in your report. This is uh, compatible with, for example, HCM or hypertension or hyperthyroidism. Okay, so with the color Doppler, you're going to see also if there's any aortic insufficiency or if there are any abnormal communication. So you can see, I put also the, the normal B mode so you can see this is, um, is the ventricle septal defect right here. This was a cat. And you can see with the color Doppler right here, the turbulent flow right over there. Also, uh, we can see if there's any up, uh, outflow obstruction, like with SAM, systolic arterial, um, anterior movement, or like in this case, if there's a turbulent flow. So for example, like with um, subarotic stenosis. 
Okay, the right short axis left, uh, left ventricle view. So in this case, we're gonna do the M mode. So this is how it should be. Uh, so the MO line uh, is gonna bisect the left ventricle. See, this is a cat, this is a dog. Um, it's gonna bisect the left ventricle. You have to be able to see the pericardium and you have to be able to see the right ventricle. So um, I wanted you to see the difference between cat and dog. Again, cats, when you have um, a hypertrophic or a very high um, frequent heartbeat, you're, gonna, you're not gonna see it this good. You're gonna see it very, very um, fast and uh, the left ventricle chamber is not gonna be as good as here. But uh, again, when you have a normal cat, you can definitely get good images. Uh, you can see this would be not the best one because you can only see a little bit of the right ventricle. Here you can see also uh, a little bit, but here would be the, this would be the best. So right ventricle, interventricular septum. We bisect the left ventricle into two equal parts. And um, we see the pericardium and we're able to see a good chamber, a good interventricular septum. That way you can do all the measurements. Okay, so how are we gonna do the measurements? Well, um, with uh, this, is um, what you have to kind of like uh, keep in mind. Uh, when you measure the walls, you're gonna include the line. That means that, um, as you can see the, uh, the arrow here, so we're gonna measure the interventricular septum. So we're gonna put, place a cursor right before the line because we wanna include the line in the measurement and right after the line here. Instead, when we do the chambers, we don't include the lines because we're measuring actually the chamber and not, not part of the wall. So we place the, um, the marker or the cursor right before the line. So diastolic measurements, we're gonna do at the onset of the QRS, um, usually. And this is where we have the maximum size of the left ventricle. Then we're gonna, uh, this is why it's very, also very important to have a, an ECG, because that way you're gonna make sure that we're in uh, telediastole. And then um, when, uh, for the systolic, we're gonna do the same thing right after the T wave, right there. So again, Please make sure that uh, you have an ECG on your on your ultrasound machine because it's gonna it's gonna help you so much. Okay, you can also do the EPSS um, here. So what you do is you do the mitral view. So you go you tilt a little bit the tail towards the heart rate. Once once we see the mitral, so the fish opening and closing its mouth, then we do the M mode, and you're gonna see this is the mitral valve. This is obviously the interventricular septum, so you're gonna measure the distance between the mitral valve at its highest point and the interventricular septum. Okay, so I was telling you before, the, um, um, with the short axis, heart base, left uh, atrium aorta view, we do the, obviously that uh, you all know, the left atrium aorta ratio. So this is the article that explains how to do it. It was, as you can see, it's from 2000, it was 20 years ago. Um, but we, we still do it nowadays. So this is the non-coronary cusp, right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp. It's very important that, um, as I was telling you before, that you see the leaflets in the view. And what you do is you're gonna draw a line, um, so you can see here, along the commissure between the non-coronary and the right coronary, you're gonna draw a line following the commissure, right up to here. And then in this, and uh, this is gonna be the frame, as I was telling you, uh, where the right after the, um, the, the closure of the, of the um, aortic valve. And um, as you can see here, first frame after the aortic valve closure. And then for the left atrium, what you're gonna do is you're gonna follow the commissure between the non-coronary and the left coronary. So you're gonna follow the commissure and parallel to it, you're just gonna draw a line. Just be careful because here, this is the vein, this is the pulmonary veins. So you don't want to include them because if not, you, were, you would be overestimating the, the size of the left atrium. So in this case, we have uh, the wall, but if you can't see the wall, what you do is you draw an imaginary line. It has to be curved, so it can't be straight. You have to follow like that. You have to follow the, um, 
um, what it would be the, um, the wall of the left atrium. Okay, so just make sure that you don't do, you don't include the, um, the pulmonary vein. Okay, um, then uh, in cats, you can also do M mode. The thing is with the M mode is a lot of times we don't bisect the, um, the atrium so good. So for example, as you can see here, you're not bisecting uh, the atrium so good. So you're not getting the maximum um, size. In this case, it was good. It was a good, uh, I mean, it was a good image. Uh, with um, with uh, mind ray, we have a, um, say a feature that it's the free X cross and it helps a lot. So what it is the free X cross is that uh, when you have the M mode, you can only move one part of the, of the beam, right, of the line. So this part is fixed and you just move it like that. So you're working with an angle. That's why a lot of times we can't. So if I moved it over here, yes, I could uh, bisect the, the atrium be better, but then I wouldn't get uh, the aorta. So with the free X cross, what we do is we can, we can do whatever we want with this line. So we can move it right like here, from here to here, and we can um, manage the angle as uh, whatever we want. So in this case, I was able to get uh, a good M mode. Okay, then with um, RVOT, so with the uh, right ventricular outflow tract and pulmonary artery view, with uh, B mode, we're gonna see uh, the pulmonary valve and we're gonna measure the diameter. With the color flow, we're gonna see if there's any insufficiency, if there is a turbulence, so if there's a turbulent flow, and also if there's a PDA, a, pa a patent duct um, uh, art <laughs> arterius, uh, so an abnormal communication. Then with, um, with the pulsative wave, we're gonna measure the flow of the RVOT. And then with the continuous wave, we're gonna measure if there's any insufficiency or if the, uh, if the flow is turbulent in that laminar. Okay, pulmonary valve diameter, inch point to inch point, right there. Color flow Doppler, insufficiency right here. A lot of times you can see it even here because obviously we're not looking at a line. Uh, it's, it's a plane, so sometimes you can have it here or here. A turbulent flow, like for example with um, pulmonary stenosis. And a PDA, so this is the area where you wanna look for a PDA. So this is a pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery. These are the right and left main pulmonary artery. So right here is where you wanna check for the, uh, for the uh, abnormal flow right over here. A lot of times what you do is when you place the color flow here, you see a jet coming in, and that way you kind of like, oh, what's that? And you, you go down and you actually see it here. There's also another view that uh, you can uh, check it, but again, we're on uh, just um, today, we're only talking about the basic views. Okay, so uh, pulsating wave. So we can do a pulsating wave of um, uh, right ventricular at flow track. So we place a cursor at the pulmonary valve, and we're gonna follow with the line, we're gonna follow the external edge from baseline to baseline. Again, following the external edge. It has, in the pulmonary uh, valve, has to be rounded, uh, a rounded wave compared to the aortic um, flow. Um, this is important for you to know because if you don't have a rounded, this is more rounded, you'll see the aortic uh, flow later. If you don't have a rounded one, it might mean that you might uh, have pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so always uh, try and uh, not only measure it, but also look at it. Okay, with the continuous uh, wave, we're gonna measure the insufficiency here. A lot of times you don't get like a very, very good image of the insufficiency, but you wanna uh, get the maximum. Also with the continuous uh, wave, we can um, uh, measure uh, turbulent flow, for example, in pulmonary stenosis, as you can see here, right over there, because for us, it's very important to measure the uh, maximum velocity. Okay, so coastal view. Um, again, this uh, is something that, uh, that is very useful for aortic insufficiency that you can measure with the color Doppler. And then with the pulsated wave, we're gonna measure um, the flow of the, of the aortic flow. And if there's any insufficiency with the continuous wave, we're gonna also measure. So here you have an insufficiency. This is a very tiny insufficiency, but still uh, is easy for us to measure it from here. As you can see, we have a very good angle. 
Okay, so uh, remember the one for, uh, with the, um, the wave for the pulmonary flow? It was much rounder. You can see here it's sharper. So this is what uh, an auric flow has to look like. This is a laminar flow. Um, we can use the continuous wave when we have either a high velocity, so we have a laminar flow, but uh, it's not enough with our, uh, with our pulsated wave to get the maximum uh, velocity. So then we use continuous wave just to get the, the maximum velocity or when we have a turbulent flow. And then we can do any order of efficiency, as you can see right here. Okay, then we go to the um, left parasternal apical four chamber view. So um, with the B mode, we're gonna do the Simpson method uh, that we're gonna explain right now. Uh, with the color Doppler, we're gonna see any mitral regurgitation. With the pulsative wave, we're gonna measure the transmitral filling pattern. And then with the continuous wave, we're gonna measure the mitral regurgitation. So let's start. Okay, the Simpson method. Um, so we're gonna get two images. I always recommend when you're doing uh, an echo, get all the images, even though you don't have to do all the measurements, get all the images and videos, because maybe in the future you want to do a measurement. So always get all the measurements and videos, uh, especially videos. So uh, once you do, um, the, for example, the right parasternal long axis view, take a video. I recommend not of one or two, I recommend like four or five uh, heartbeats in one video, because that way you can see, the, especially when we have, for example, uh, sinus arrhythmia. So four or five uh, beats, take a, yeah, it's probably like, maybe like four or five seconds video. Um, then take images, obviously take uh, pictures, but um, with the epical view, we're gonna do the same thing. So you get a video of, um, of a, a long, I would say like a, a long video, because that way you can make sure that you get the best image that you can. So uh, we're gonna measure two different uh, images. One of them is gonna be in end diastole. So as we've been saying uh, all the way through the presentation, it's gonna be more or less at the curious uh, onset. Sometimes a little bit after, as you can see here, in, my, in this case, it was right after uh, the R wave. So at the end of the R wave, uh, what you want to make sure is that uh, mitral valve is closed and we have the largest volume, so they have the largest size. Then with the systole, we have, we're gonna get, um, sorry, we're going to do the end systole, and it's going to be the frame before the mitral valve opening, which is usually after the T wave. Okay, so what are we going to do? Um, with, the, with the mind ray, you can either do the automatic or the, um, or the manual one. So with the automatic, um, method or you're going to do is you're going to draw the line with the base so the mitral analyst right there then you're going to draw a line of the maximum length of the left ventricle and then automatically it's going to um it's going to tell you what is the area but then you have a little hand that you can um correct a little bit because obviously it's not perfect uh but it, i have to say it's pretty good so you might have to correct it a little bit in order to follow all of the endocardium same thing with the with this um, systolic one with the manual one, what you do is you just follow the endocardium all the way, uh, left ventricle and mitral valve. And then it's just gonna um, calculate the area by itself. Okay, so here you have two uh, good articles about um, the Simpson method. And this is in two breeds that are, uh, it's very important to do the, the Simpson method. I don't do it with all the dogs, I have to say. Uh, I usually do it when, um, when you are so sure the, uh, the volumes that you get with the mode are, are accurate, or um, especially with dogs that are, you, you wanna make sure that you have a good, um, a good measurement of the ejection fraction. So um, this is an article about boxers. So it's gonna give you pre specific uh, reference ranges. And this is uh, a very good article about uh, the guidelines for uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and uh, for screening um, guidelines for dilated cardiomyopathy in Doberman. Okay, so um, anti-solic ventricle index. So this is indexed to the body surface area. The normal ones are going to be between 49 and 93. And uh, the end systolic ventricular index, uh, sorry, volume index is going to be between 22 and 50. So these are the normal ranges. In Dobermans, from this article, we can see that um, 
the end diastolic volume index, again, to body surface area, is going to be less than 95. And the end systolic volume index is going to be less than 55. If we have something over this, these ranges, then indicates occult DCM. So even though you don't have anything else, you just have this, it indicates uh, occult DCM. So take a look at, uh, at this article because it's, um, it's very clear. There's something that I forgot to tell you, but um, what we have to do, as I, I was telling you before, we have to measure both. So we have to measure in right personal um, long axis view and apical view. We do the uh, Simpson method in both and we use the largest volume. Okay, then we do with the color Doppler, we're gonna see the mitral regurgitation. So in order to, um, let's say, measure the regurgitation, um, there are very different ways and uh, they're, I have to say, they're a little bit complicated and long. So uh, a way that we can use that is easy and very fast, it obviously has more errors, obviously because it's very subject, uh, subjective, but uh, what, um, what we can do is we can uh, measure a ratio between the regurgitant jet area signal, which is gonna be this, and the left atrium area, which is gonna be this. So as you can see here, this is gonna be the um, regurgitant jet area signal. So you have to compare this to the whole area. If it's less than 30%, we have a mild regurgitation. If it's between 30 and 70%, we have a moderate. If it's over 70%, we have a severe regurgitation. Again, this is something subjective. Um, you have to make sure that you get a good image of, um, of the whole jet. And in this case, for me, it would be a moderate. We're all almost close to severe, but um, for me, I would say that this is kind of like a two thirds, so it's 60%, so it's still moderate. Then we're going to do the transmetral uh, filling pattern or diastolic filling pattern is the same thing. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to place the cursor, so the two lines, we're going to place them right uh, where the tips of the mitral leaflets are in, in, dia sorry, in early diastole. Okay, so we're going to place it here. So don't place it where the mitral is, place it where the, um, the tips are. This is where you're going to get. You're going to get this type of wave or this, or this, or this. So these are the four patterns that you can get. The normal pattern, the ratio between E and A, which of, um, once you measure it, uh, the machine is gonna <laughs> automatically calculate it for you. So it's gonna be over one. The deceleration time is gonna be of the E wave. It's gonna be between 52 and uh, 108 milliseconds. When we have an impaired relaxation, for example, when we have um, um, either HCM or for example, um, systemic hypertension, we are gonna have uh, the EA ratio, it's gonna be less than one, so it's gonna be the opposite. This, the acceleration time is gonna be normal. With pseudonormal, we're gonna have uh, the EA is gonna be the same thing as um, normal, it's gonna be over one. The, the acceleration time is gonna be either normal or decreased. So you're gonna ask yourself, so how can we uh, differentiate between these two? You might have to, to do the Tissel or Doppler. <laughs> And then uh, with the restrictive filling, uh, we're going to have the EA is going to be way over one, usually considered two. And the deceleration time is going to be um, lower, so it's going to be lower than 52. So E wave goes for early filling, right? So it's going to be between the T wave and the P wave. Very important that you get an ECG, because if not, uh, for example, when you have a sinus arrhythmia, you're not going to know, or when we have a, a very fast, um, heartbeat, you're not going to know which one is the E, which one is the A, and you might uh, just confuse an impaired relaxation with a pseudonormal or the opposite. So always try and get an ECG. Um, then you can also do the TDI, obviously the Tesla Doppler. Um, but yeah, so the E wave is going to be between the T wave and the P wave. The A wave is going to be more or less at the onset of the QRS, so right there. When we have a very, um, a very increased heartbeat, we, uh, the, the waves can be fused, so you're not gonna be able to differentiate both waves. So in this case, the solid killing pattern is not gonna be accurate. This is, uh, for example, we have a, a dog, it's 180 and 82 um, uh, beats per minute, and you can see here, and you can follow with the QRS, you can see here, okay, maybe this is the E, 
But what about the A? We can't see it very, very good. What I did, this is the same dog. What I did is I just waited a few minutes, not, not long. I may just be doing other stuff with, uh, with that. But then I remeasure it again. Now we went down to 157. And you can see that now we can have the two waves. So be patient. It's just going to take maybe one or two minutes um, longer. But that way you're going to have a good, uh, a good filling pattern. Okay, then with the continuous wave, uh, we're gonna measure the uh, mitral regurgitation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna align the line of the continuous wave line. We're gonna align it with the regurgitation. Now we have also this little angle that you can also uh, move. That is gonna help you a lot. So you can also move it like this and you have to align it because a lot of times we don't usually have a central. If it's severe, we might have a central. If it's um, a mild, for example, with um, dilatic cardiomyopathy, um, we might have it also central. But a lot of times we have it either posterior or anterior. So you have to align it, uh, align very good. The mitral regurgitation should be between five and six, the velocity should be between five and six meters per second. And this is why. So these are the normal systolic pressures in the, in the heart. And we're going to have here, uh, the left ventricle is going to have a systolic pressure normally of 120. This is going to be the same one as the aorta. And um, the mitral regurgitation is going to be the difference between uh, these two pressures. So if we have a mitral regurgitation that is way over six, so closer to seven, we might be looking at systemic hypertension. So when you have a, a very high um, mitral regurgitation, always recommend to do, uh, to do a blood pressure. When we have it on the other way, when we have it way over or uh, lower than four or five uh, meters per second, you have to do two things. First of all, you have to try and align better just to make sure that you're getting a good wave, that you're getting most of it. Uh, another tip is uh, when you're using the, um, uh, either the pediatric, the pediatric maybe not, but uh, the uh, neonatal um, one, the neonatal probe, so a probe that is high frequency, for example, with cats or uh, with small dogs, with very, very high um, velocities, you're not gonna be able to measure it. So with regurgitations, if you see that you're not able to get a good wave, so this type of wave, then uh, change probe and uh, switch to probe that is a, a lower frequency. If after you do that, you still get a low um, velocity, then you might be looking at systemic hypertension. Okay, the five chamber view. So these are the same, um, same measurements that, um, that we could do with the subcoastal view. So if you haven't already done it with the subcoastal view, you can do it here, obviously, pulsative wave or a continuous wave of the, of the aortic valve. And then um, if there's any aortic insufficiency, you can do it with the color and with a um, continuous wave. Here you can see a little aortic insufficiency, but as you can see, the, the beam is not as good as the other one. And here we're measuring that uh, insufficiency. Okay, we move to the left side. So left personal, apical, optimized, sorry, <laughs> we will go to the right side. Um, so left personal, apical, optimized for tricuspid valve. So we're gonna concentrate ourselves in the right side of the heart. Um, we, uh, with the color Doppler, we are gonna see if there's any tricuspid regurgitation. Make sure that um, the little area that you put for the color Doppler is not too big because here, is the aorta. So a lot of times you have a very big square, kind of like very big area. You might get the flow of um, the aortic flow and you might think that that is a regurgitation and, um, and it's not. So make sure that you do, that you restrain the area to the tricuspid valve right here. Also we can do the M mode, uh, the TAPSI, which is a new, also another, also going to see later another measurement. And with a continuous wave, we're going to measure the tricuspid uh, regurgitation. Okay, so with the color Doppler, we can also do the, um, the same evaluation of the uh, regurgitation as we did before, but it's going to be harder to evaluate because uh, we have more errors. So you can say mild, moderate, but it's, going to, it's not going to be as accurate, let's say, as the other one. 
the TAPSI. So I'm not going to go over the, uh, what uh, the TAPSI. So it's a tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So what it is, it's um, it's a measure. The it's um, a ratio, is it like that? That uh, is going to provide you with um, um, a number that uh, is going to help you measure the right ventricular systolic function. So now we're concentrating now. The new articles are concentrating a lot of the um, function of the right ventricle. And because uh, we didn't have a, a lot of measurements with that. So this is a new thing. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to do the M mode at this side right here. And then uh, like with the EPSS, more or less, you're going to measure the excursion of the uh, tricuspid leaflet um, in, um, with the right ventricular anterior wall. So again, these are the two articles that are going to talk about it trying uh, and read them. This one is from 2012. This one is a little bit, uh, um, I think a little bit later on. Okay, and then the continuous wave, um, we're gonna measure uh, the tricuspid regurgitation. Same thing as with, um, with the mitral regurgitation. So we have to align very good. And in this case, it's very, very important because most of the times we're gonna have a regurgitation that is gonna be posterior. So the direction is gonna be towards uh, the outside of uh, part of the, um, of the heart and that a lot of times is not gonna when it's anterior it's very hard to align but uh, when it's posterior also you're gonna have to uh, optimize the view uh, to be aligned very very good and just make sure that you get um, when you when you have the feeling that you, uh, you're gonna be getting um, high velocity switch probes even though you lose the quality of the image you're gonna gain um, the, um, the quality of the of the Doppler and that is going to that is going to be uh, obviously it's going to switch from being a normal dog with a tricuspid regurgitation or a dog that it could eventually have um, pulmonary hypertension. So when it's over 35 millimeters of mercury um, at the pressure, it can suggest pulmonary hypertension. So it's not a diagnosis; it can suggest it. So look for other signs, like for example hypertrophic uh, right ventricular, um, the intraventricular septum that is, um, that is flattened, so look for those. Okay, and then uh, clinical cases. So I put uh, two, mm, I think we're good with the, with the time. Um, so Luna, Luna here, um, she's a mixed breed um, dog. She weighs 12 kicks, but she's overweight. And uh, she's 11 years old. So in June of 2019, uh, she came in for a first echo after they noticed a heart murmur, and obviously we um, we diagnosed her with uh, myxomatous mitral valve disease. She had a mild left ventricular enlargement. Uh, the normalized uh, left ventricle internal uh, dias uh, internal diameter in diastole it was 1.8. Uh, so we recommended uh, pimobenzin, which <laughs> they never started. So uh, after six months, uh, in January 2010, she comes in for a recheck, which is great. And this is what we find. So left ventricle doesn't seem, at first, doesn't seem pretty big. The aortic flow seems laminar with the M mode. It doesn't seem, again, this is something that is subjective, right? It doesn't seem uh, very, uh, let's say, very enlarged. But, um, well, actually, uh, the... Uh, aorta uh, and left atrium uh, aorta um, ratio, it was a little bit over. You can see I, sometimes I do it like that, it's the same thing as doing it the other way. Uh, there was another uh, article that, um, that it says that um, there's no difference between doing both. So you can see that sometimes I do it like this. And then the mitral regurgitation, um, yeah, it was a moderate, so it was okay. But this is what happens. With the subcostal, we have, um, it was laminar, but we have a very high velocity uh, flow. So in this case, it was over two, usually up to one, one and a half would be okay, but it was over two. And the mitral rotation in this case, it was around seven. So it was pretty high. So being an overweighted dog, um, I just said, let's just take a look at the adrenal glands. And uh, the adrenal glands, the left one was normal. The right one was a little bit enlarged. So our plan was, uh, I recommended uh, measuring the blood pressure, recommended blood work, and I recommended a uh, complete uh, abdominal ultrasound. So with the blood work, it showed elevated um, liver enzymes, the blood pressure showed systemic hypertension, it showed uh, 200 um, uh, systolic uh, arterial pressure, 
and then uh, the abdom uh, abdominal ultrasound showed enlarged uh, right adrenal gland and the liver. So they did a DACTH a stimulation test, and it was in the gray zone. Also, well, seeing that it, it was in the gray zone, um, we said, let's measure the water intake, and it was normal, as for the, as for the owner. So we didn't start any treatment for uh, Cushing's disease, because we didn't have a diagnosis of Cushing's disease. But I would start a treatment for the, obviously for the high blood pressure, so I'm not even, the thing is that we're not, we're still not uh, able to control it. We have lowered down to 180, then we, obviously we changed the dose, but uh, a few weeks ago I did it again, it was still 187. So now the plan is, first of all, repeat the blood work to see if anything has changed, because now, right now we're June, it's been six months. Um, we're gonna repeat the ACTH test, maybe do a low dose on the dexamethasone simulation test, we're going to recheck the ultrasound, um, the abdominal ultrasound, maybe do a contrast and haste ultrasound of the right adrenal gland to see if it's maybe a pheochromosome and it's not Cushing's disease. And uh, ML, uh, I also recommend it to recheck echo, so we'll see. The thing that you have to take uh, home of this is that uh, without the echo, we would not have been able to, to find hypertension because the, there were no clinical signs as per now. Obviously, later on, uh, we'd find it out maybe because uh, she would be blind or maybe because uh, she would start drinking a lot because uh, she, had, um, she had kidney disease. So it's very important that uh, we do all the measurements because a lot of times we find out things, uh, not very surprising things, but uh, uh, it's very important that we do all the measurements. And then uh, cold case number two is Evo. Yes, her name was Evo. <laughs> She wasn't as evil, but uh, she wasn't also an angel. Um, she, was a, she is a Sphinx cat. Uh, she's a female and she's 10 months old. So they called me for a breed screening and uh, they wanted to make sure that um, she didn't have HCM. And um, the thing is that they thought that she was pregnant because uh, she, she had like a big abdomen. Um, there were no murmurs in, uh, um, during the auscultation. So this is what we found. Well, I didn't find HCM. Uh, it was 4.8 millimeters and Sphinx is up to five. So she didn't have uh, HCM. And, um, and I have to say most of the rest of the, uh, of the echo was almost normal, but what we can find here, 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 and here is a uh, ventricular septal defect. So um, again, this cat was complete normal and uh, she was, um, she didn't have any murmurs or anything like that. So I checked her abdomen, just praying that she wasn't pregnant, obviously. And she wasn't. What she had was uh, uh, some content, uh, liquid content in her uterus, either a pyometra, hydrometra, hemometra. Um, so what we recommended, we recommended spaying as soon as possible for two reasons. First of all, because she couldn't breathe. Obviously, with a congenital um, defect, uh, it wasn't recommended to breed. And then obviously because it was dangerous uh, for the patients. So what you have to take home uh, from this is that uh, we need breed screening. It's, it's imperative, it's necessary for two reasons. Uh, for uh, patients that are gonna be breeding, obviously, please, before they get pregnant, because a lot of times they come in, oh, they, uh, she just had a litter, and uh, in order to give them away, we need, uh, we need um, an echo to say that uh, she doesn't have HCM, and then boom, she has other things. So before getting pregnant, please do um, screening. And then also for not breeding animals is for the patient's health. So in this case, probably not gonna give her uh, a lot of problems. Uh, we're gonna do some rechecks all, uh, over time, but uh, again, very, very important to do screening. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop the share. Let me see here. Okay. Okay, Sarah, thank you. And so, uh, while we are waiting uh, for uh, the, the video, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, after the video, please don't, let, don't leave uh, the meeting because uh, we uh, will uh, organize the question and answer section. And after that, uh, I will give you some information about the next uh, ultrasound webinar. Okay, Sarah, if you are ready. I am ready. Say? Okay. Okay, good. So, um, 
in this video, I we try. I don't know if you were also in the other in the other webinar. We tried our best to do uh, a good job of um, taking uh, Im an image that you could um, you could see how I was putting the probe, how I was positioning the probe within the animal, and also uh, seeing the image in the um, in the ultra machine. Uh, sorry if sometimes it gets a little bit, it moves a little bit. Uh, but I think the, the best thing is that you can see how I position the, the probe. So before I start the video, also I wanted to, um, to show you that I, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm not going to be talking, I'm going to be talking right now. Uh, I'm not going to be talking in the video, because obviously with the mask, you couldn't hear it. Uh, but uh, the ECG electrodes, uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, the red is going to be on the right side. So remember, red, right, RR. Then the yellow is going to be on the, yeah, on the left side, and then the green one is going to be in the hind leg. When we're in this position, it's going to be always in the dorsal hind. When we switch positions, it's always going to be in the dorsal hind. These two don't change, so yellow is always in the left, right, um, the red is always in the right, but the green one, I switch it to the dorsal one. And this is my dog Google. So, okay, let's start. Um, so I'm sh showing you here the red, the left, I'm sorry, the yellow and the green. The marker is going to be towards the spine, dorsally, and we're going to do a 45 degree. I'm going to go underneath. I have a table here that is going to elevate the dog so I can go underneath. And as you can see here, I get the image. I'm, I'll show you now better. So marker towards the spine. There we are. We have the uh, right personal long axis. I'll show you right now. We can move a little bit, as I was saying before, we can rotate a little bit to get the maximum uh, length of the, vent uh, the ventricle right there. You can't see the ventricular uh, outflow flow, so right there. Sorry, I flow tracked. <laughs> so I'm doing a video, I'm taking a video of that. And then I rotate it a little bit to take uh, the five chamber view right there that I'm showing you the aorta, left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, and right atrium. So what I did, I'm going to show you now. <laughs> with the hair. I rotated a little bit, so from 12 o'clock to 11 o'clock without moving the, the transducer, just rotating a little bit. So I placed the collar Doppler. Let's see. Oh, I took a video of that, then I placed the collar Doppler. You can see that I, uh, the area is switched in order to be long. And then I'm going to do the short axis. So we're starting like this, then like that, and then 90 degrees with the first one, and then we optimize by just fanning the tail. As you can see here, there we are. I'll get a, good, a better image. <laughs> there we are. So we fan uh, to, uh, with, the, um, with the tail towards the spine in order to be right underneath the mitral valve. Right there. See, exactly, right there. You see the mitral valve moving? Right underneath is where you want to place the, um, the M mode. Okay, we bisected. So I was switching right now. Um, I was um, increasing the gain in order to have a better image of, uh, of all the walls. Right there. I'm, and I'm going to show you now. Uh, I moved to the mitral valve, and you're going to see right there that I'm showing you th that is the mitral valve in order to do the uh, EPSS that I can show you here, exactly. I, I'm sorry that I, you can't see very good, but um, we wanted to make sure that I, you saw also the, the probe. So I went over with the tail towards the sternum in order to get the heart base. So I'm starting from here, and then I tilted a little bit, and there we have aorta, left atrium. And then what I'm doing is I'm with the, um, with the QRS, um, sorry, with the ECG, I'm going uh, where the T wave is, right after T wave. I'm going uh, to do the left aorta, um, sorry, left atrium aortic ratio. Okay, and you can see here, left article is right underneath here. So I always recommend to get at least two measurements, not to only stick with one, because that way you're going to see, or you're going to have a more accurate one. So we uh, stick with two or three or whatever you want. And then you can more or less see the, um, the cusps over there. So I'm measuring again, 
right, and I'm, what I'm showing you here is that I, I draw an imaginary line because that is the, that was the vein. Okay, so in order to get the, um, the pulmonary vein, I'm gonna show you what I did. So I rotated a little bit and then I moved the transducer towards the sternum. So I rotated a little bit, but then I moved the transducer towards the sternum. Sometimes you don't have to rotate. Uh, I just did it in order to get a, like a better image. You'll, you'll see uh, once you get the image, if you have to rotate a little bit or not. I, I placed the color doppler. I had a little bit of insufficiency right there. And then, as you can see, it's pretty much aligned, but I have to move a little bit the angle right there. And we have a, a laminar flow that is pretty rounded. Sorry for that, <laughs> for that movement. Then uh, we look at the, uh, the right main uh, pulmonary uh, artery and the left one. I'll always take a look at those. And what I did is exactly, I lifted a little bit in order to show them a little bit better. So I started with that and I lifted them a, li a little bit just to see them. Okay, now we're gonna do the subcostal. So the marker is gonna be towards the spine and I'm gonna go underneath. This is the diaphragm, this is the liver. Uh, here I needed a little more gel and more alcohol, so please be patient. I'll, I'll show you now um, what it was. Obviously it was a little bit dry, so I, I wasn't getting a good, a good image. So marker towards the spine and we go from underneath. So liver, diaphragm, and I'm moving a little so you can see. So what happened with Ugo is that uh, he, he didn't eat, but uh, he had a lot of, uh, of gas, so I wasn't able to actually see, and that happens, that sometimes happens. You can see the left uh, atrium right here, but I was trying, you could see there's a lot of, uh, of gas, so I wasn't able to do it. So now uh, we switch to the left side, put the, the ECG, and we're gonna place the marker towards the spine. So right there. Okay, we do a third degree angle. And as you can see, right there. So what I did is uh, exactly the third degree angle. Right there, we have a very straight and parallel long axis. Okay, took a video, then I uh, go with the Doppler to make sure that there's no regurgitation. Okay, then I go with a pulsated wave to the tips, please, uh, where the tips are. And I go with a pulsated wave. You can see right there. You're gonna have to uh, put the line, the baseline, so uh, like at the bottom, so you can see everything. Uh, what I was trying to do there, um, and then it took me a little longer to, uh, that time, but uh, I always turn, out, uh, turn down the audio because uh, a lot of dogs get very nervous when they hear it. So uh, E wave, A wave, plays with, uh, with the QRIS and the T wave. It was a normal pattern. And then what I did is um, for the tricuspid valve, so I'm gonna show you what I did. So I tilt the tail towards the spine. And again, I, in this case, I didn't need to, to go one inter, uh, intercostal space, uh, cranial. Sometimes you have to, sometimes you don't. But uh, the most important is that you put the tail towards the spine. There was no regurgitation. And now I do, I did in this case, I did it in a, in a different order, but uh, I rotated a liver from the apical view. I rotated a liver to see the aorta right there. So. I also, oh, that's another thing. In order to align it better, um, I probably forgot to tell you before. So in order to align it better, I'm gonna stop it. In order to align it better, what you do is you also tilt the tail a little bit towards the sternum um, in order to, uh, to align it a little bit better. So I place the pulsated wave. And we get the sharp image of the aortic flow. And then we do the color wave. We see there's any insufficiencies, which there weren't. And that's about it. Okay. So, Mauricio. <laughs>